Hey everybody, it's Michael Schwartz with Gun Owners Radio, and we're here with Polk County Sheriff, Sheriff Grady Judd. Polk County is, of course, you can see in the background, a uh, in the great state of Florida. In fact, Polk County is uh, smack dab in the middle of Florida, just just to the uh, east of, of Tampa, I believe. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. East of Tampa and west of Orlando. If you look, most of the property or the ground in between there is our county, 2,000 square miles. It's an enormous county, too, for Florida. Florida tends to have smaller counties. In California, we have enormous counties. Sure. And Polk County seems to be unusually large for, for California, geographically large for uh, for Florida. Yes, it is. It's, it is 2,000 square miles. And our population's a little over 750,000 people, about 787,000. And how long, you, you've had a, a, an extremely successful career in law enforcement. Um, you've uh, read your bio and you've moved along uh, very successfully and, and um, quickly. It, like you were right out of the, right out of the shoot. You were uh, a professional law enforcement, moved up the ranks and have had a lot of high profile um, uh, things happen in your career and successes and uh, done a fantastic job. Do you want to just talk a little bit about your background and how you got into law enforcement and how you became sheriff? Sure. There's never been a time in my life that I didn't want to be in law enforcement. I mean, from the time I was a child. And I graduated from high school when I was 18 in June. And in July, the sheriff at the time, Monroe Brandon, hired me as a dispatcher back in what we call the radio room back in the day. And I worked there until the following year when I turned 19 and they sent me to the police academy. And then I went out on the road as a deputy at 19. I was the first deputy they ever swore in under the age of 21. So it's been a lifetime. This is my life. It's not a job. It's not a career. This is who I am. And it's been a true honor to work at the sheriff's office. I worked there 32 years worked my way up through the ranks, did most every job that we had in the operations side, spent a great deal of time supervising homicide, criminal investigations and narcotics and organized crime on the special investigation side. And then the great people of Polk County agreed to allow me to be their sheriff in 2004. My boss retired and I ran for office and I've been the sheriff ever since. I took office in January of 2005, and I'm in my fifth term as sheriff, and I'm the longest serving sheriff in the history of this county. Wow, congratulations. What, what's you. something you're most proud of? I mean, something when you look back at your career, whether it was back when you were 19, 20, or, or recently, what's a story, maybe an interaction with somebody that you're most proud of? Well, first and foremost, I'm proud that today crime is at a historic low rate. In fact, our crime is at a 51-year low rate. Our crime in unincorporated Polk County and our service cities where we contract is at 1.1 crimes per 100 per year. Now, the state of Florida is a real low crime rate of two crimes per 100 per year. In California, y'all are way, way higher than that because of some of the rules that your legislators and city commissioners and county commissioners have decided to enact as laws. But our crime rate is really low, and that's, I think, what I'm most proud of. Other than that, the next thing that I'm most proud of, and it goes hand in hand, is we have a focus on chasing predators, child predators. And I stated one time that if you're a child predator, we will chase you to the ends of the earth. And my detectives, who are simply the very best, did exactly that. We had a child predator that was in Australia that had groomed a mother to sexually abuse her children while taking videos and sending them to him. So we arrested the mother. We sent the children to other relatives for mental health counseling and help. And we filed charges against him in Australia. It took us five years to get the extradition process done. But the U.S. Marshals picked him up and delivered him to us. And he then went to state prison here for his horrible crimes. Wow, that's amazing. Um, what, uh, 
one of the things you talked about is is the low crime rate in Polk County, especially compared to California, which, and I, I got to tell you, I can totally agree uh, as far as some of the law enforcement policies in California, it's been uh, a disaster. It's, there are parts of California that look like, um, you know, Beirut at, at its, at its worst. I mean, it's, it's, it's gotten to be really bad. But I, I want to emphasize that you're indicating that this isn't a national trend. In other words, it's not that crime has dropped throughout the country. It's that crime has dropped in Polk County and, dro- and crime has dropped in Florida because of policies that you guys have implemented. It, it is a very di- different situation in your county compared to other parts of the country. This isn't just a national trend that you guys have benefited from. Um, it's something that you guys are doing. Is that... I, I just summarized a lot and kind of asserted a lot, but is that, can, can you talk about my statement I just made? Certainly, that's absolutely correct. I can assure you that the police officers, the sheriff's deputies, the state police in California want to put bad guys in jail. They want to improve the quality of life. The reason you don't have a quali- good quality of life in your neighborhood or in some neighborhoods, the reason your crime rate continues to escalate that's not the fault of the law enforcement officers. You've got to look at your elected prosecutors. You've got to look at the laws that your state legislature passed or that your city or county commission has passed as to their ordinances. They keep telling you across this nation, they're preaching, oh, low-level nonviolent crime. Well, they're just out of their mind. The difference in a low-level nonviolent crime and a violent crime is what does the guy decide to do today? And this quote unquote low level nonviolent crime, we have a different word for that. It's called quality of life crimes. So the people that are sleeping on your sidewalks, that are trespassing on your property, that are stealing from you, that are going to the local stores and stealing and not being held accountable and not being arrested and not being incarcerated, That's not the law enforcement officer's fault. That's not the community's fault. It's the people you elect to public office that enact those kinds of rules. So if you're in California, in the San Diego area, or any place else in the nation, and you're overrun with crime, understand this. Change your elected officials. Until you change them, and the new ones you put in have a different attitude, a different philosophy, you're going to continue to have crime-ridden communities. That's a guarantee. I've not only done this as a law enforcement administrator, not only done this as a deputy and a sheriff, but I spent 23 years as an adjunct at both the University of South Florida and Florida Southern College, which is a liberal arts college in our community. And I've studied the data, and I've studied the causation of crime. And quite frankly, the people that are allowing you all to be run over with crime are not telling you the truth, are not being honest with you. You can have low crime, safe neighborhoods, as well as Florida and many other states. It just depends on how much crime you will accept. So, with that in mind, um, you were the you were appointed a member of the Coordinating Council on Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Um, what what are some what are some what what are truly the cause, or what are some preventative measures to make sure that that basically kids don't grow up to be criminals? You know, or or, or how and, and also how often is it that that what happens to kids causes them to be criminals as adults, or do people just become criminals as adults? Well, first and foremost, I was appointed to that council two weeks before President Trump left office. And miraculously, after the new administration came in, my paperwork was lost and they said, what appointment? So I never solidified that appointment with the paperwork because they Trump administration didn't get it to me in the last two weeks of office, and the next administration didn't know what I was talking about. But I can tell you that there's a lot of causations for crime. There's a lot of children that aren't given a fair shake or an opportunity in life. You can look at their parents who are drug addicts, 
who are alcoholics, who don't care for their children. But the bottom line is you've got to start dealing with these issues at the cradle. When they get 13, 14, 15, 16 and become hardened criminals as juveniles, you've got to deal with a here and now. Regardless of how they got there, they're there. And if you don't deal with them, if you don't have the appropriate programs or appropriate probations and ankle monitors and counseling and mental health counseling and programs to take them from the community, show them discipline and accountability and responsibility, their crime is going to continue to increase. So when you continue to let them go and let them go and let them go, crime be becomes not only their job, but their way of life, and it pays off. As I used to tell my first-year college students, crime committing has got to have a lower priority than not crime committing. Now, to make that simple, you've got to take the value out of committing crime. So when the risk of committing crime is high and the value or the return is low, people don't commit crime. But when the return or the value of committing crime is high and the risk to committing crime is low, people will continue to commit crimes. Unfortunately, we don't do enough at, from the cradle to their teenage years. And as a lady told me one time when her 13-year-old was creating problems and she was there in a drunken stupor, do something with him. And I looked at her and I said, ma'am, how am I going to fix him in 15 minutes when you've had 13 years and you've created him to have this personality? So aside from mental health issues that you have absolutely no control over, I can tell you, you can look back to the mother, the father, or the lack of the mother and father and see where the problem is. But that doesn't excuse criminal conduct today. There still has to be accountability and responsibility. And I'm finding that in your major cities, New Orleans, Chicago, Detroit, DC, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, it, it, pick your large metro areas, any place across this country, your rule makers or your lawmakers think more of the criminals than they do the victims. And that's why you have what you have. And it starts with teenagers and moves right on up. So do you think in the last in, in, in the last fifty years, is is that is that what's changed or what, what has changed in law enforcement? What has changed with criminals in the last fifty years? Because it seems like things have gotten a lot worse and a lot more complicated in about the last ten or twenty years. Well, I had someone the other day tell me here in this county, they said, golly, you know, our murders are up. They're terrible. I, you know, no, our communication system is better. You know about more. Hmm. Tonight on the evening news, the national news, which wants to push gun control, will find some shooting someplace in the United States, bring it into your neighborhood, into your community, into your home in Southern California and make you think that the whole world operates like that. Well, it doesn't. They don't tell you. We've got one crazy shooter here out of 330 million people in the United States. They don't do that. But the reality, communication's better. But I've been here back in the day in the 70s and 80s when I started in law enforcement in Florida. The felons owned Florida. Crime was out of control. We were doing all those hug-a-thug things here, and people were being victimized. But a magic thing happened. 17 tourists, many of them from Europe, were murdered over about a two-year period in the late 80s. Now, never mind the fact we would have been telling them for years and years, crime's out of control, crime's out of control. Once it become an economic issue for the state of Florida, which is a vacation state, people come from all over the world to come to our beaches, to come to Disney and Universal, Lego land, all the things that y'all also have on a smaller scale in California. But they come from all over the world. When 17 people that were tourists were murdered, some in rest areas, some in the hotels, some in the streets near the special areas or the beaches. And Europe gave a travel warning be careful about going to Florida on vacation. It's dangerous. 
miraculously things happen. And here's what happened. They decided we needed a 1020 life bill if you used a firearm in commission of the felony. They decided we needed minimum mandatories for our prolific criminals who don't learn. And at the end of the day, guess who signed that into office? Not a Republican governor, but a Democrat governor. Our crime precipitously started to fall, and it's fallen every since, because we put tough on crime laws in Florida. Despite that, we have pre-arrest diversions, post-arrest diversions, mental health help. We have veterans courts, mental health courts. We provide services, but we focus on the prolific offender that commits crime over and over and over and does very violent crime. And that's who our system lands on very hard. And as a result, our crime rate is very low. People enjoy our beautiful state and our beautiful beaches and all of the attractions that we have here. And they're safe and they feel safe. And I have people moving here. I've had 80,000 people move in my county in the last three years. Did wow. you hear what I said? 18,000 people. They're coming from New York and New Jersey and California. We're seeing a lot of people from California we didn't used to see. And they're telling us we're coming here to get away from high crime. We want to be safe and we want to feel safe. And we welcome with them with open arms. And then I tell them, hey, listen, we're glad you're here. We're glad you brought your children here because they're safe and you're going to be safe. But remember this, if you come here and vote the way the majority of the people voted in California and Illinois and New York and New Jersey and Massachusetts, you'll still have warm weather here in the winter, but you won't have low taxes any longer and you won't have low crime because it's the decision makers that you put in office that decide whether you're safe or not. Your police force will always work hard to protect you and keep you safe. You know, I remember uh, those those murders. I actually grew up in Panama City in the 80s um, and, and, and loved it. Loved Panama City, Florida was so beautiful and so nice. Um, and I absolutely remember there was a uh, statewide scare um, when when those tourists were were killed. And it was a it was a big deal. It was a big story. One of the other things that happened right around that time is uh, Florida was uh, one of the first states if not the first state to go shall issue with, with concealed weapon permits. Um, and they, it's a, it's, it's, you know, it's been a success story when it, when, when, when it comes to logistics and that sort of thing and all the horror stories that the anti-gun folks said would happen, but did not happen. But, uh, but my question to you is how much do you think Florida becoming a shall issue state, a, and allowing people who pass a background check and fill out the application and take the class to carry for self-defense outside of their home. How much did that have an impact on lowering the crime rate in Florida? Well, I think, it, I think there's a lot of different pieces that add to it. And that's another piece of legislation that makes a positive difference. And then Florida's taken another step. This legislative session, the governor's already signed the bill that as of July 1st, if you're not a convicted felon and you don't have mental health issues where you have been deemed a risk, anyone who's not a convicted felon can carry a concealed firearm without a license. Now, if you don't get the license, then you don't have reciprocity with many other states. But at the end of the day, good people with guns are not the problem. Bad people with guns are the problem. A gun is an inanimate object. Until someone recklessly or with evil intent points a gun at somebody and pulls the trigger, that gun doesn't hurt anyone. But I tell folks, if you're going to carry a firearm with a permit, or now as of July 1st without a permit, you need to care enough to learn how to safely handle the gun, how to shoot the gun safely, because otherwise you'll end up hurting yourself. Or if you think you're going to carry a concealed firearm and if somebody assaults you, a bad guy comes and assaults you, and I'll point the gun at him. I won't shoot him, but I'll point it at him. 
I want you to understand something clearly. A true bad guy is not intimidated when you point a gun at him. He'll take that gun from you and shoot you with it. So never point a gun at anyone unless you have a legal, legal lawful reason to do that and a legal, lawful reason to use deadly force. I always tell people, even though we have stand your ground laws and castle doctrine laws, get out of the situation if you can first. If the bad guy forces you in the corner and provides a threat that's of such magnitude you think you're about to suffer great bodily harm or death, shoot them. Shoot them a lot. Shoot them so that you can read the local newspaper through them. So that's one, you know, when I talk to people who are concerned about uh, permitless carry or constitutional carry, I, I get the concern, you know, there's definitely, you know, having training is better than not having training, but that's not really the concern. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, and, and that is a really good way of explaining it is if someone is, is carrying and whether or not they have a permit, if they're a good person, they're not going to commit a crime. Just because they get a permit doesn't mean that, you know, they're less likely to commit a crime. Uh, they're, a, they're a good person, permit or not. But if you don't get the training, you're far more likely to hurt yourself um, when, you're, when you're carrying or, or attempting to, to defend yourself. Um, you're not more likely to hurt others. You're not more likely to become a criminal. Um, but it's still, I think it's a worthy uh, debate and a worthy discussion on, on uh, you know, when it comes to training. But really what constitutional carry seems to do is it, it, it puts the responsibility back on the person. We, we trust you as a citizen. We trust you as an individual, as a human being. We know you're responsible enough to get the training you need to be successful with carrying. And I think that's a good stance for government, right? What are, what are your thoughts on that from that perspective? No, Michael, I believe you're exactly correct. A gun is a dangerous tool if you don't handle it safely, if you don't know how to handle it, if you don't understand that a mistake with a gun can be a deadly mistake. And we work a lot of accidental discharges here where people cleaning their guns shoot themselves. And you know what they tell us about 99.9% .9 of the time? I, I, I thought, thought it was unloaded. Was <laughs> I thought it was empty. Well, yeah. you always treat every gun all the time like it's loaded. And if you do that, then you won't shoot yourself accidentally or someone else. So at the end of the day, I love the Second Amendment. I believe you can't own too many knives or too many guns. But I also believe that if you want guns and to carry guns, you've got to care enough to learn how to handle them and carry them safely so that you don't hurt yourself or someone else. So there's two more things I want to talk to you about. First is um, you are uh, relatively close to Broward County, which of course is where the horrible tragic shooting at, at Marjorie Stoneman happened. And there were a number of uh, public policy changes uh, after that, as a result of that. One of them is, that's particularly interesting to me is, um, if, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in Florida, it is state law that you have to have a deputy or a law enforcement officer, uh, at schools. If there's a student at school, there has to be an armed deputy there. And, and I believe the ratio is one, one law enforcement officer per 500 students. Did I, did I get that right? Is that the new, one of the new policy changes? No, what, what the law simply says is that, all schools, while all public schools while in session have to have either an armed guardian or an armed law enforcement officer at school. And then internally, the standard is if, uh, and it's high schools, middle schools and elementary schools are never this large, but in high schools with over a thousand students, for every thousand students, you need one law enforcement officer. So if you have 1,100 students, you should have two law enforcement officers. If the school is 2,200 students, it should have three law enforcement officers. But the reality is, in addition to that, we have guardians at the elementary schools. We have officers and deputies at the middle and high schools. 
but we also have the authority to have trained guardians that are not law enforcement officers, that are school teachers, school administrators, school principals, and that's a decision made by the individual school district. I'm on the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Commission that investigated that horrible, senseless tragedy that should have never occurred. And there's not enough time for me to tell you all the wrong things that occurred that day with that system. But I can assure you of this. On that particular day, the response by the Broward Sheriff's Office was a train wreck. It was horrible. Their deputies that was on the campus failed to rush in. I can also tell you that the school system was a train wreck, that they didn't have the systems and processes in place that they should have. I can tell you that the county government and the communication system was and is still a train wreck. Broward County is the most unbelievably ill-prepared community that I've ever seen. Then we passed the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Law where they had to have people on campuses. And it's safer now on the school campuses than ever before. But guess what? The very last county to come in compliance with the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas laws that was mandated after the shooting, after the massacre in Broward County, the entire state of Florida, the last one to come in compliance was Broward County mm -hmm. where the shooting occurred. It's a mess so now. I, I think that the, so I was actually asked by a local uh, city council member, um, kind of indirectly via the press, um, the comment was something along the lines of, well, you know, they should come up with laws that prevent uh, gun violence and then we'll talk. It was, it was kind of a challenge, you know, and, uh, you know, challenge accepted. I'm, I'm in the middle of doing exactly that. And one of the things I'd like to do is talk about some of the changes that happened in Florida as a result. And, and uh, um, you know, I, I, what would you tell, what would you say, if you had an audience of people that were reasonable but were generally considered anti-gun, they don't like the idea of firearms, they don't like the idea of people carrying firearms, you know, they're reasonable people, they just maybe haven't been exposed to it. They, you know, in, in California, the laws have been so strict that there's a generation and a half of, of people who make it well into adulthood, who've never even shot a gun. They've never touched one. It's a total foreign object to them. All they know are movies and, uh, you know, some of the horrible myths about guns. What would you tell that person who's genuine, genuinely uh, interested in school security? Um, what would you tell them about armed law enforcement protecting, protecting their schools? First and foremost, I, I would tell them that if they study the school shootings, they will find out that every one of the active shooters that went onto a campus, every one of them violated all kinds of state law. So creating more state law does not make you safer. It does not make you safer. Creating state law that takes guns away from honest, law-abiding citizens makes you less safe because when the good guys don't have the guns, the only one left with the guns are the bad guys because they don't follow the laws. But what I would tell them is we need to work together. Certainly guns on campus, that gun on that campus is not the first solution to the problem. It's the last best solution when everything else has failed. You've got to have interventions. You've got to have robust communication programs. You've got to encourage the kids. If you see something or hear something, say something. And then when we identify those children, uh, that and it's usually a student or, an, or, a, or a recently graduated student that's very dangerous to themselves or other, there has, to be, has got to be systems and processes to make sure they have medicine, mental health, that we follow them, that we track them, that we, sh that we know what and where they are, and that we can get firearms away from those people. Those, because many of those, and most of your active shooters, they're not traditional criminals. They don't have a long history of criminal conduct. Usually they're significantly mentally ill 
or challenged people that go in and shoot up schools or they're loners. But with almost without fail, almost without fail, and I underscore that, after it's over, they go, well, you know, I always thought he'd be a shooter. Yeah, I knew something. He said something. He saw something. He wrote something. And nobody says anything. So there needs to be layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of work up front. And then the armed people on campus need to be the last best hope when everything else failed. And I'll end with this. I asked a school teacher in Broward County who was against having guns on campus. I said, on that day, in that instant, when that horrible, evil person walked onto that campus for that moment in time, when he pulled that rifle out, if you knew then what you know now, would you have liked to have somebody there to confront him and shoot him to stop him from shooting all those children? And she said, yes. I think that's a strong point. Um, I know we're, uh, we're, we're just about out of time. Do you have two minutes to just talk about one of the things that you're well known for is doing press conferences and actually announcing specifics about people who've been arrested uh, for, for various, can you talk a little bit about that and, and maybe um, talk about it from uh, as if your audience is um, skeptical of that idea. Maybe they're not, you know, for people that aren't a big fan of that idea and think that maybe, um, you know, just aren't a big fan of, of that, that type of, of, uh, you know, press and that type of publicity for people who have committed crimes. Um, could you just spend a couple of minutes talking about why you do it? What are the benefits and, and why people shouldn't be skeptical of that? Sure. First and foremost, if you don't want your government or your law enforcement agency to reveal who you are and what's going on in your community, don't commit crime. If you're a crime committer, doesn't your neighbors have the right to know that there's a dangerous person that lives in the neighborhood with him? Doesn't the store owners have a right to know that you have a proclivity to carry guns and shoot people and rob people and break into houses? Don't they have a right to know? You see, we didn't go out and pop up these photographs and talk about people before they committed a crime. It was after they committed a crime. They chose to make themselves a public record. It's already public in the state of Florida and most other states. So why shouldn't I warn the good people who to be careful around, who to look out for? Why shouldn't I keep you safe? and not worry whether or not their picture's on the evening news. They chose to have their picture on the evening news because of what they did. So let me ask you, do you think more of the criminal that raped the child than you do the next child that could be raped if they didn't have the ability to get away from such criminal? Come on, think about it. Think about it. Do you care about the victims? Do you care about keeping your community safe or do you want to protect and hide criminals so they can be more successful at victimizing, raping, murdering, robbing, and stealing from you and your neighbors? There's your answer. Well, Sheriff, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming on here and, and uh, doing such a good job of explaining uh, your, your views. And I uh, appreciate the job that you've done in, uh, in Polk County, Florida. And uh, please, uh, uh, if you get the opportunity, send my best to all your all your deputies and your your whole staff, and and thank you so much for joining us today, Michael. Thank you so much. I'll leave you with one last thought: the crime in the state of Florida is two crimes per hundred people per year. It's one crime per hundred people per year in Polk County. How high is it in your neighborhood? <laughs> and then suggest, then I suggest, who's doing it right? Thanks, Sheriff. Thanks for watching this Magnum episode from Gun Owners Radio. Check out our other Magnum interviews with leaders in the Second Amendment community on our YouTube channel today. Don't forget to support our sponsors. Click on the links in the show notes and support the businesses that support your Second Amendment rights. Like and subscribe to help defend and restore the Second Amendment, not just in California, but across the country.